thank you, Eva, and thanks to the organizers for kind invitation. So the main therapeutic goal in MBS is uh, to cure the disease. But at present time, we still have stem cell transplantation as the only potential curative treatment. So if uh, stem cell transplantation is not indicated, uh, we are trying to reduce risk of complication, for example, and mainly bleeding infection. And we are trying to reduce risk of disease progression to prolong survival and to improve quality of life. Uh, what is main focus of uh, new treatment approaches in low-risk MDS patients? It's improvement in profound cytopenia. That means correction of anemia, correction of rate of ineffective erythropoiesis, and correction of life-threatening thrombocytopenia. What is behind the defective erythropoiesis in MDS? Defective proliferation leads to formation of hemichromes, and it's... Um, it's leading uh, to iron release and to formation of reactive oxygen species. The result is increased lipid peroxidation that leads to apoptosis of erythroid precursors. The mouse doesn't work at all. It works on an opposite. Doesn't work, doesn't matter. Uh, so we have growth defense in factor 11, BMP 11. And it's a TGF beta superfamily protein that binds active in receptor 2. It leads to activation of smart transcription factors and to stimulation of proliferation and to blocking of differentiation. A high GDF11 level has been described in patients with high rate of ineffective erythropoiesis. We have two new drugs, Sotatercept and Nuspatercept. Both of them are chimeric fusion proteins consisting of modified active in receptor 2 and FC gamma chains. And these proteins are capable of GDF11 mediated inhibition of proliferation and reactive oxygen species formations. And they are able to stimulate differentiation of normal erythroid progenitors. The third new drug is galonisertib. It's active in receptor 2 kinase inhibitor. And Ari Gagundis and co-workers from Germany presented at the last ASH meeting uh, results of phase two study of administration of Luspatercep <coughs> in low and intermediate one risk MDS patients. The patient had high transfusion burden or low transfusion burden and low hemoglobin level, high zero EPO level, or they were not responsive or refractory to ESA. Luspatercep was given an increasing dose in initiation of the study and then as a maintenance treatment in extension study. And the authors were showing very high rate of response and improvement and 27% of patients achieved transfusion independence. Response and achievement of transfusion independence reflected zero EPO, serum EPO level. You have heard a lot about lenoidomide from Ari, just briefly, and we have also seen this cartoon yesterday during Kulka Malkovati's lecture. Lenoidomide binds to cerebellon, the substrate adapter of the CLR4, CLB, and equiubiquitin ligase, and induces recruitment of specific substrates, for example, casein kinase 1A1, to this ligase and to the ubiquitination by this ligase and subsequent degradation. Degradation of CK1I leads to death of del 5 q cells because they express CK1A1 at hyperinsufficient level. Uh, Ari already mentioned the efficiency of an idomite in non del 5 q patients, showing that predictive factors for response in various Santini study was serum EPO below 100 units per liter and also previous ISA treatment. What we are showing uh, during, we'll be showing during the MDS Symposium in Valencia is that cerebral messenger RNA level in non del 5 q patients may be predictive for efficiency of linalidomide. You may see here the serum or cerebral MR levels, and you may see that only patients with very high cerebral messenger RNA level 
achieved transfusion independence. Similarly, decrease in cerebral and NR level may predict loss of response to analidomide and has been already mentioned repeatedly that also increasing TP53 mutational burden may predict loss of response to lenalidomide. Several drugs have been tested in combination with lenalidomide to enhance lenalidomide efficiency. Lenalidomide is able to inhibit ubiquitin C3 RNA41 ligase complex. That leads to reduction of ubiquitination of EPO receptor to EPO receptor stabilization and to increased EPO sensitivity. In the same way, combination of dexamethasone and lenalidomide has an additive effect on increasing the production of erythroid cells from CD34 positive cells expressing RPS19 or RPS14 RNAs, probably due to inhibition of P53 activity. Two studies have been recently published showing that combining clonalidomide and EPO may improve erythroid response over lenalidomide alone in lower risk non del 5 qmds patients with anemia which is resistant to ESA. The response of the combination arm was between 35 and 40 percent in comparison to lenalidomide monotherapy. The response was between 15 and 25 percent. We were present during the MDS meeting in Valencia results of our study combining clonalidomide, EPO, and prednisone in patients with deletion 5Q, and we saw hemoglobin response in 9 out of 15 patients. Two drugs have been studied for correction of thrombocytopenia. Aregiagonidis again uh, has been presenting uh, the results of study of phase 3. Uh, study of romeplostim in low and intermediate advanced patients with thrombocytopenia. The study was prematurely stopped because of possible risk of disease progression. And Ari, in his final analysis, showed that a significant decrease in clinical relevant breeding events was in patients with platelet counts between 20 and 50,000 per liter. A significant decrease in number of platelet transfusion was present in patients with platelet counts below 20,000, and there was no adverse effect of romipositin on survival or AML transformation, 6% for treated versus 5% for non-treated patients. There are several studies with phenolidomide or hypomethylene agent plus minus romipositin always MDS, and generally patients who received romipositin had a trend for higher platelet counts, less platelet transfusions, and decrease in bleeding complications. The second drug is l -trombopac. It has been already mentioned here that Esther Oliva recently published results of administration of l in increasing dose to achieve platelet counts in low thrombocytopenic patients and to achieve platelet counts below 100,000. They reported platelet response in 47% and achievement of transfusion independence in 54%. There was again no difference uh, in AML progression between the two arms, thrombopac treated and placebo treated patients. Other agents for lower risk MDS may be imetalstat. Imetalstat is a telomerase inhibitor targeting RNA template of telomerase reverse transcriptase. It has been shown effective in patients with SF3B1 or U2AF1 mutations, and it was effective in patients with RAS or RAST. Another drug is ruxolitinib, well-known JAK2 inhibitor that affects abnormal activation of JAK-STAT system by deregulated pathways that are involved in innate immunity signaling in MDS. First studies in low and intermediate one risk patient was in the subgroup who failed at this one therapy, and there is some response after administration of ruxolitinib. Main focus treatment uh, of new treatment approaches in high-risk MDS is how to treat patients after failure of hypomethylating agents, and how to improve results of allogeneic stem cell transplantation. That means how to increase number of transplanted patients 
and how to reduce relapse rate after stem cell transplantation. Outcome of patients after hypomethylating agents failure is generally poor. It has been shown by Prebet and co-workers uh, that allogeneic stem cell transplantation is still most effective approach, but median overall survival after stem cell transplantation in patients who failed treatment with HMA is only less than 20 months, and only a small subset of patients is eligible for stem cell transplantation after failure of HMA treatment. What are treatment approaches to patients who failed treatment with hypomethylating agents? Maybe combination of azacitidine with other drugs not acting as epigenetic modificators, as rigocertib, pevonidistat, nivolumab, ipilimumab, combination of azacitidine with new inhibitors of histone deacetylase as panobinostat, vorinostat, and new hypomethylating agents as enacidinib or varicitabine. Very briefly, combination of azacitidine and rigocertib. Rigocertib is an inhibitor of rasraf mak pathway and interacts with the RAS binding domains of RAF kinases. PACE study, PACE 2 study, is combining azacitidine in standard doses with oral rigocertib response in approximately half of patient complete remission in 21%, but median duration of response only eight months. Pevodinostat is inhibitor of NEDD8 activating enzyme, deregulates activity of cool-independent ubiquitin E3 ligases, and that leads to inhibition of ubiquitination of proteins with important role in cell cycle progression and signal transitions. The results of phase two study are similar as results with rigocertib response in about 60% of patients, complete remission 32%, but median survival again 8.5 months. Panobinostat is inhibitor of histone deacetylase that leads to accumulation of acetylated proteins to induction of growth arrest and apoptosis, and it has synergistic effect with azacitidine. Phase two study of combination of both the drugs was not so promising as expected. The response rate was between 37 and 38%, and there was no difference between other and pasobinostat and as alone in both concrete rate, remission rates, and estimated one year survival. Similarly, combination of other cytidine and vorinostat or lenalidomide didn't bring superior effect in phase two study compared to other cytidine monotherapy. New drugs affecting methylation may be enacidinib, its IDH2 inhibitor that reverts mutated IDH2 inhibition of T2 gene and block differentiation. There are some promising results in number percentage of complete remission, but very uh, response, but very low complete remission. Guadicitabine is next generated methyl transferase inhibitor with prolonged exposure and reduced metabolism compared to decitabine. Phase one had to study very good response rate and median overall survival 15.2 months. What are new approaches to stem cell transplantation in MDS? Uh, first is the use of high dose post transplantation cyclophosphamide. Our active T cell recognition uh, recognized of all antigens on dendritic cells, and that may lead to T cell activation, interleukin 2 production, and proliferation. These proliferating our active T cells may be killed by a properly timed high dose of cyclophosphamide, which is an S phase specific drug, and that's given on day three. And this approach may promote graft host tolerance after allogeneic stem cell transplantation. This is a scheme of non myeloablative HLA haploidentical stem cell transplantation with high dose cyclophosphamide on day three post transplantation. And this approach enables extension of potential benefits of our stem cell transplantation and GVL effect to patients who lack an HLA related donor and may reduce incidence of fatal GVHG, graft rejection, and transplant related mortality. These are some results uh, for 
about haplostem cell transplantation in MDS patients. Uh, these studies are unfortunately mixed uh, with patients with AML and MDS. We are showing uh, uh, two years overall survival more than 50% relapse rate between 25 and 35 patient, percent. Uh, this is the very last study presented during the EBMT meeting in Marseille in March. Uh, these are the data from EBMT registry. 230 MDS patients uh, underwent haploid stem cell transplantation. 66% were patients with high risk and that are probably more realistic for years over cyber 38%, but very high rate of non relapse mortality. How can we reduce relapse rate after stem cell transplantation? Uh, we have seen that haplo stem cell transplantation in MDS leads to estimated two years survival in more than 50% of patients. However, relapse is still the main problem affecting survival after allogeneic stem cell transplantation, regardless to the type of donor. It's still higher than 25%. Uh, what are the options for reduction of relapse rate after stem cell transplantation? It's choice of condition regimen according to the new prognostic markers. We know that adverse markers are TP53 mutation, very poor cytogenetics according to IPSSR. We may administer preemptive donor leukocyte infusions, and we may try to perform maintenance treatment after stem cell transplantation. DLI administration. Several works are showing the results of DLI administration as Preemptive administration. This is a Dutch study, very effective, showing three years survival in 77% versus 45% in non treated group. Similarly, a significant decrease in relapse rate. This is a new study, again presented during the EBMT meeting, showing combination of preemptive administration of DLRI and low doses of azacitidine. And the authors are showing 66% of two years overall survival, 28% of relapse. There's a recent study from Japan, Japanese group, uh, uh, presenting results of administration of DLI at the time of molecular relapse. The response was very good, molecular relapse. The patients responded in 56%, but the relapse rate after treatment is again relatively high, 28%. And finally, administration of combination of DLI and azacitidine as a treatment of over relapse. American study from 2015, complete remission and partial remission rate 33%, two years over survival, 66%. And the last slide is showing uh, new approaches to maintenance treatment after stem cell transplantation. At the ESH meeting last year was one study showing the efficiency of panobinostat as maintenance treatment after stem cell transplantation in MDS. Very high estimated two years over survival, 88% and a little bit lower relapse rate as 21%. And I think that's all.